Nation. Welcome into this week's Renegade Rundown. Um, I can't believe this guy said yes, hit him up. He was, you know, we were fortunate to get him on the show. Jake Crane from Crane & Company, the Daily Wire hit show right here on YouTube. These guys do an amazing job. We were just talking about it off stage. this kind of new era media thing going around. They have a giant platform. They don't beat around the bush. They give you straight facts. Jake played college football. He was in the sport for six years. Just really happy to get him on here and get to talk FSU Clemson from a more of a national perspective. Of course, we've got Chris Frazier from Spear Attic Willis, friend of the show. You you've seen plenty from Chris. And uh thanks for joining us, Jake. What's going on, man? Oh no, man. Happy to be here. Obviously, it's the uh another big week for Florida State. It seems like every other week, uh, y'all have one of the marquee games. I was on a, a Clemson show a couple weeks ago, so I feel like I should balance the scales a little bit, but uh now nah, I'm excited. Y'all do a really good job, and uh, man, I'm I'm really looking forward to this game Saturday. It's such a great slate of games, uh, and this this is just one of them. Man, it kind of started off slow. We had the the big week one game to come out the the gates, and then you know week two and three is a little bit slower. But this thing is nuts. This is one of the best slates we've had in a long, long time. Florida State, uh, you know, this will be five in a row if Clemson can get this win in Death Valley. Seven, it'd be number eight in a row total. You know, the ninth year, one of those games didn't actually end up getting played. The line's around two and a half points. Um, we're really lo- liking where we're at as Knowles. I haven't done a prediction yet. Chris has got a prediction and pick, you know, for a pretty slanted victory. Um, you know, to be two and a half points up and it be in Death Valley tells you a whole lot. It being a day game uh, maybe takes a little bit of that home field advantage, but still at the end of the day. This is Death Valley. This is Clemson going on the road. Um, giant matchup, the big noon game on ABC. What do you think, man? Do you think uh, the Knowles are ready to overtake Clemson for the ACC, or do you see Clemson maybe making this a little bit harder than it should be? Well, you know, we uh, we, we have our picks. We got David Pollock as our guest picker, our, our game day picker coming out Saturday, and, and uh, got a pretty good idea of where I'm leaning on it right now, but – you know, when I look at this game, it's you know there's a couple things going into it, and and I know Florida State fans understand this. I mean, you have a you have a wounded animal in Clemson right now that's backed into a corner. Uh, not only that you lost the first game of the year, talking about Clemson, but it's a conference game. You lose two games now, and you look around the rest of the conference. I mean, it's it's a problem to try and make the the ACC championship game now. Like, there's no guarantees with what we've seen from North Carolina and and some of these other teams. You go down two games and you have two losing tiebreakers to two teams that may be able to be there in the end, you may be on the outside looking in. Uh, I do think playing earlier is obviously an advantage. Um, it's something we talked about for the Auburn A&M game. Any game that's at 11 o'clock, the earlier you can play, the less uh, liquefied, what I like to say the crowd is. Um, that's always an advantage when you get to eat a pregame meal that's bacon and eggs, you know, eating breakfast for pregame meal as opposed to, you know, pasta and chicken and all that stuff, getting ready for a night game. But, Matchup wise, uh, you know it's it's no secret. Uh, Florida State, from a skill position standpoint, to me, that's the biggest advantage they have in this game. Not that they're not good up front, but I think Clemson has a better chance to put up a fight up front than they do on the outside. When you look at, especially Florida State's all uh, Florida State's offense uh, com- compared to what Clemson's offense has out wide. You know, it's been one of the biggest problems for Clemson. You know, I don't see the T Higgins out there. I don't see the Nuke Hopkins out there. I don't see the Justin Rosses or, or any of the guys that, that kind of elevated Clemson to this new level. And if you can't create separation against guys at Charleston Southern, best of luck against the Avengers that Florida State's got running around on that defense. Uh, so I, it's, I think it's going to be a tight game. Uh, it, it's one that Clemson has to have. I mean, they're going to play their guts out. It's at home. Dabo's pissed. Uh, people are questioning his methodology. And, and I don't put a lot of stock into last week what happened against Boston College. You know, historically, Boston College has played really well in that red bandana game. That was a Super Bowl for them. Castellanos, I think, is an underrated player. has really come on for them since he was named the starter. But Florida State's going to be ready. Uh, that They'll be ready, and, and it's a matchup, like I said, man. I'm excited to see it. Things going to be awfully physical. Yeah, there's no doubt. There's a big difference in that 11 o'clock kickoff in Boston and, right, you know, being down here at Clemson and avoiding yeah. that nighttime atmosphere. And, yeah, Castellanos – the athlete that he was, I don't, I don't know if Florida State was quite ready for it. I know that we recruited him as an athlete, kind of all the top programs around the nation that were recruiting him, recruiting him as an athlete. 
So it makes sense, you know, for him to end up at Boston College as a quarterback and just come out and, you know, put that kind of performance on against Florida State. It just makes sense. It seems like that happens to us every year. And like you said, man, Clemson, like a wounded animal. I mean, they've, they've struggled. But another thing we've seen over the years, even last year, they were really struggling. And it seemed like all of a sudden FSU gets in there and um, Clemson has their get right game, if you will. And they go on to win the SEC. So hopefully, you know, that we, we can win the matchups. Like you said, it's going to be real big for them to get Keon Coleman and Johnny Wilson and make those catches, not have the little mistakes, you know, in situational football, et cetera, stuff like that. But one big thing that people have talked about, they really think Nate Wiggins is going to be able to, the Clemson people think he's going to be able to lock down Coleman or Wilson or whoever's on his side of the field. And I don't doubt, you know, he's going to win his share of plays. But, you know, one thing that they haven't talked about is they're going to lock these guys up in man coverage, and that means they're going to have their back to Jordan Travis. Mm -hmm. So I just – I'm not sure what their plan is going to be, and I've heard a lot about man coverage, and I just don't see that necessarily being the answer uh, against what we have. Well, that that's what makes Florida State dangerous. You don't just have one of them. You know, as as a defensive guy, you can't double everybody. You can't do it in basketball. You can't do it in football. Uh, and and when I look, yeah, you shut one of them down. You look at the giraffe that is Johnny Wilson. You got Jaheim Bell there in the middle. But you brought up a great point with Jordan Travis. This is Jordan Travis 2.0 to me. Here's what makes him scarier this year than last year. Last year, he would scramble to run. This year, he is scrambling and keeping his eyes downfield and looking to scramble to throw and then run. And nothing scares you more as a defensive coach, as a defensive play caller, than when it turns into a scramble drill. Because look, even if you're running zone coverage, it's zone until it's man. And it turns into a scramble drill, and the guy keeps his eyes downfield and is looking to make a play. He does two things. One, it keeps him in the game from a health standpoint. I think that's something that was beaten to his head during the offseason. You've got to be able to protect yourself a little bit more and stop taking off and taking these hits. Get rid of the ball to the open guy. Let's get to the next down. But then he also has the ability to recognize man coverage. And I think him and Jaden Daniels both did a really good job of this in the first game. Recognizing man coverage in the drop and then taking off, getting the first down as much as you can get, and then sliding. Old Jordan Travis was just scrambling to run. Jordan Travis 2.0 is scrambling with his eyes down the field, which is scary as hell. What cost LSU? They spied Harold Perkins on him, played umbrella coverage behind him. He'd scramble to run, and when you spy somebody, it takes a player out of coverage. That's why I felt like Johnny Wilson and all these guys were running wide open in the intermediate game because it's a math problem. You didn't have enough numbers in the middle. So I think that's where Jordan Travis is really upgraded, and I think it's going to help him elongate you know, his, his career, not only at Florida State, you know, hopefully you never wish anybody to get hurt. But in the NFL, too, that's a big check in the box from scouts. Guy keeping his eyes downfield when he extends the play inside the pocket and outside of the pocket. I love it. I couldn't agree with more with any of that. And Chris down here, man, like I told you, I didn't play. I'm not the biggest X in those guys. But Chris, Chris, man, he can go all day with you. And I'm sure he's got a few things for you down there. What's going on, Chris? Oh, just enjoying, you know, a couple of days before the game kicks off. But, um, yeah, I think a lot of, if not all of what Jake just said is exactly what I think that myself and a couple others have been echoing because uh, I can't say who said what first and don't really care about that part. But um, what I think Florida State is doing to Clemson into this particular game is putting them in an area that they're not normalized with anymore because this is the first time since 2014 that they've been an underdog at home. Um, and that says a lot. And we, yes, we were the team that they were an underdog to in 2014. So it hasn't happened in, in quite some time. Uh, now, do I think the players are paying attention to that? No, not really. Uh, do I think that national media and media folks are talking about it? Uh, yeah, because of statistics that you bring up. But I tell a lot of people with this game in particular, you kind of got to throw statistics out the window. Because if you look at what Clemson has done in the first three weeks of play, you can't really use their statistics when you've got Cade Klubnick and a multitude of starters sitting on the sidelines come third quarter. So to base their statistics exact, I think it's kind of harsh. Uh, And the same thing with Florida State when they played against Southern Miss, you had over 102 different players in that game. So statistically – Things are going to look a little bit wonky, plus you're you're only looking at three weeks of statistics anyway. Um, 
the, the best the best game that you can do it with Florida State would obviously be uh, with LSU. I would think that you could get a generalized idea of what Florida State's defense and offense is and what it can do. Um, and then with with Clemson, I would love to say that you could do that with the Duke game, but that was one of the weirdest games that I've ever seen <laughs> played uh, with the mistakes that were made uh, on Clemson's behalf uh, and also what Duke made a lot of mistakes in that game. I, I, I get that Clemson made the mistakes that – mattered more because of what Duke did after the, the incidents of what happened. But um, Duke wasn't by any means uh, a perfect uh, team in that game. They made mul- multiple mistakes. But Florida State should go into this game attacking the middle of the field. Um, be- the reason being is because both of their preseason all-ACC uh, linebackers have played very under what everyone expected from them. Um, and I don't know if that's because the coach is putting them in position not to succeed or if they're making decisions based off of what they're doing and uh, going to the flat too much. I'm not sure what it is that's causing them issues, but my anticipation is is that this is one of the most talented defenses that Florida State will play. And not necessarily do I think they're going to have it all together, but if they bring the majority of what has been missing for them over the past couple of weeks together, this game will be tight. Um, and, and to my opinion, I think it's tight all the way till after halftime, a little bit until the third quarter, and then I feel like Florida State starts pulling away from them because it's the halftime adjustments that Florida State coaches are making, and I don't think mm-hmm. enough people talk about it. Preach. But the, the halftime adjustments that Florida State makes, um, I, I put second to none across the country because I'm, I'm paying attention as best as I can to everyone. But it seems like after the second half, same way with Boston College, the only unfortunate measure there was is we got complacent and we were satisfied with our lead and then we start making mistakes again. But in this case, you put your foot on the gas uh, from the first snap that you get all the way to the last snap of the game, regardless if that's taking the victory knees or whatever it is, you still never become complacent in that game and play four quarters of football and you Florida State should come out with a win in this one just based off of how both teams have performed over the past three weeks. And what's really missing at Clemson, I don't think has been answered in one, two weeks. Yeah, yeah no doubt, man. And, you you know, one of the things surrounding this kind of deal and the reason Clemson, you know, from, a, from an outsider's perspective has kind of struggled on offense, you talked about it. That was Clemson's M.O. That kind of middle eight of the game, last four minutes of the half, first, you know, drive of second half, first drive of the game. That used to be what they did. You know, that's kind of how they cleaned us up last year. In the middle of the game, they just kind of executed. But here looking at this year, they bring in an offensive coordinator in Garrett Riley who, you know, showed up at TCU and lights the world on fire the second half of the year once he gets his offense really going. And when he showed up at Clemson, you know, I'm, I'm wondering what you think about this, Jake. The first press conference after the tough game against Duke, Dabo goes out there and he says, well, you know, he came here to run the Clemson offense, you know, your quote unquote Clemson offense, not the Kevin Riley offense, not the air raid, you know, that he's famous for. Do you think Clemson, you know, kind of loosens the reins? Do you think it's been overblown? Do you think it is more Kevin, you know, or Garrett Riley's offense than it is the quote unquote Clemson offense or? Just, yeah, I'm, still, like I'm seeing Garrett thing. Garrett Riley's offense. That's that's what it looks like to me. The only difference is all the receivers at TCU are playing for the Chargers. Max Duggan's in the NFL, <laughs> and Miller's running the ball as a rookie uh, in the league, and they're pretty good on the offensive line. I mean, I, I think sometimes we forget players win games while coaches watch and talk about it. The team with the best personnel is most likely going to win the game if the coaching is just adequate. There's been a lot of coaches that are, excuse my language, dumbasses that look like geniuses because they had better players than the other team and vice versa. So I think a lot of it comes down to personnel. But but he has made mistakes, and I'll give you some examples. I'm trying to figure out how a guy like Garrett Riley, as smart as Garrett Riley is, is going up-tempo all the way down the field till he gets inside the five-yard line, then stops, and then comes out in two-by-two. Two. I don't care if it was 11 personnel or 10 personnel. And Duke runs zero coverage, and they bring more than you can block, and you're still running his own read, and they blow the mesh point up twice and turn you over. Um, and the one time that you threw the ball, you ran the bluff to Will Shipley and you scored a touchdown because they're in zero coverage. That's the part that shocked me. Now, I don't know if that's something to where Dabo's like run the ball down here or slow it down and run the ball, but I'm very, very surprised that Garrett Riley made those decisions multiple times 
in important places. So I think it's gear <clears throat> schematically. I'm basically seeing the same thing I'm seeing at TCU. They just don't have the cats that TCU had. I mean, again, look, look at Davis, Chargers, Johnson, Chargers, Miller, NFL, Saints, I believe. They got a couple offensive linemen, right, that, that are gone. And Max Duggan lit the world on fire and ended up being a Heisman finalist. I mean, again, you know, it's it's anybody can walk down the runway, but if you don't look like a supermodel, them clothes ain't going to look so good. No doubt, man. That's like you watch the Swamp documentary, and they act like Urban Meyer came in down there and just walked into, you know, the Sisters of the Blind and the Poor and didn't have any talent. But, man, he won basically those titles with 90% Ron Zook recruits. Like, the cupboard was not bare. That was – the Jimmies and the Joes make it. You saw it. You know, Ed O goes and wins it in 2019. Chizik has the one brilliant year with Cam Newton. You know, you got to have the dudes. Um, the kind of conversation now really surrounding Clemson and Florida State is where those dudes come from. Dabo Sweeney really has, like, not wanted to use the portal. He'll grab a backup quarterback here, bring a guy out of retirement, kick like he did, with you know, this week against us. But do you think, like, is he going to break down and maybe adjust, maybe start having those exit meetings and start doing a more Alabama, Mike Norvell approach of pushing guys out and bringing guys in? Or do you think he really holds firm? We had a conversation, like, there's just not roster spots. Like, it, the way he does it, it's not like even if he wanted to use the portal, You've only got 85 spots. You bring in 25 guys every year. Like, it's just, there's just not really room for them to do it. Yeah. Well, I mean, shoot, now you can bring in 85 if you want with the, with the new rule. But, look, here's here's the way I look at it. I think you have two different Dabos conflicting with each other. One, I built this thing how I built this thing, and I'm going to stand my ground, Dabo. First, I'm really competitive, Dabo, and I want to win like we were winning before. Which one falls first? I don't know the man personally, so I really can't answer that question. I would like to think it's competitive, Dabo. I think you lose enough games, it has an effect on you. Um, the second thing is, it's kind of like my grandmother. My grandmother's 85 years old. She's set in her ways. She's had the same toaster for about 20 years. That thing works about once every three to four times you put toast in it. And I've told her, I'm like, Grandma, I will buy you the, the SpaceX version of the toaster, the Cadillac Mercedes-Benz of toasters. Just let me get you a new toaster. But she will not let me buy her a new toaster. That's just a long way of saying Dabo probably needs to evolve and buy a new toaster. One of the best compliments I think that, that Nick Saban doesn't get enough credit for is that he's malleable even at the top. You have to be. It's like being a stockbroker. The same way you played the stock market when you got rich in 2002 doesn't mean it's going to work in 2023. It's like with the hurry up, no huddle with Nick Saban. All he did was complain about it for two years and realized they weren't going to change the rule. So what did he do? He went and hired the best hurry up, no huddle guys in the business and started winning again. If you're not evolve, I say this on the show all the time, you adapt or you die, you evolve or you dissolve. And Dabo, at least at this point is not evolving or adapting. And there is an expiration date on, on that way of thinking. So which one competitive Dabo that wants to win or Dabo that I built this, you know, my way, and I'm going to keep doing it my way, uh, or I'm going to be done? I don't know. That's the biggest question. That's the unknown. Chris, you got any questions for Jake? You got anything else you want to talk about before he gets out of here? Yeah, Jake, I am i don't know if you've given, and I don't need a score prediction from you, need to say, but what's the pathway for Florida State to win this game, and what is the pathway for Clemson to win this game? Yeah, um, just I'll start off with Florida State. Uh, I think a lot of it for Florida State is playing clean, uh, not going down there and and extending drives for Clemson on offense by penalties, uh, not having procedural penalties on offense, not putting the ball on the ground, which I think you have a mature offense. I know there were some turnovers last week against Boston College, uh, and then obviously Jordan Travis's health. I think if Florida State goes out there and plays a good game, Florida State is a better team, and I believe in gravity. I think gravity will take effect. Uh, that's not saying Florida State can go down there and just play average and win, but they need to play a solid game. They need to make solid adjustments. And one of the things I like the most about Florida State is, and, and Chris, you brought up a great point. I mean, Mike Norvell and his staff do such a great job making adjustments at halftime. And that that's that's the game. It's everybody has a game plan. Mike Tyson said every, everybody has a plan. You get punched in the mouth. They may come out and be running something different. It's how you adjust. It's like life. It's the adjustment to the adjustment. Uh, so if they go down there and, and decide, hey, 
if we want to get we want to play bully ball at some point, we've seen them get under center and single back and run it right at people. I thought that was the best compliment I could have given Florida State after that LSU game. They were more man than LSU was in that first one. Now for Clemson, um, it does seem that Florida State, their weakness on defense, and it's a weakness on a lot of defenses, is mobile quarterbacks, right? Now look, Cade Klubnick isn't going to go run against the Jamaicans in the next Olympics. I'm not saying he's that fast. But he does run well enough to be able to extend plays, hold that backside defensive end on the zone read, hold that Nichols eyes uh, when they're running their RPO action stuff that Garrett likes to run. He has got to be effective with his legs. It's the only way I think that they can stay on schedule because I don't think if they get in third and six and third and seven and third and longer than that, they can just line up and say, Ark, Bo, Ark, Bo Collins is better than your guy. I, I, I don't think they have that. And obviously, Will Shipley's got to be a huge part of this game. I know that. We all know that. Florida State's going to be keying in on that. But I do think, and, and to harp on the first game against Duke, if Clemson is going to win this game, they're going to have to score touchdowns in the red zone, and they're going to have to hit some explosives that score because Florida State really bows up in the red zone. And we've seen the way Clemson struggled. Uh, you really kind of find out who you are as a team when that field shrinks. Uh, but they're going to have to hit some home runs from 40 yards out. They're going to have to take some shots to loosen those safeties up which should help them in the run game. I expect trick plays. I expect reverses on special teams. I think Clemson's going to empty the bag. But Cade Klubnick's legs, plus their effectiveness in the red zone and hitting a few explosives to steal some points, uh, I think Clemson's got to catch a few breaks to win this one, to be honest with you. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Y'all brought up some great, great points, you know. And not to bring it back to Boston College, but – and that's another reason that I don't – you know, put any, you know, stock into what we saw. Well, some, you know, there's issues, but too much stock into the team we saw last week. Because if there's one thing Norvell does, as well as those adjustments in game, is showing up for the big game. Even going back to 21 against Notre Dame, you take that team to overtime. Um, they've been known to come out and look deflated and, and not ready to play against lesser opponents, but they've never had a problem under him getting up for these giant games like this one. And, yeah. And, well, and this I mean, one is definitely giant. I mean, go back and look at any team that, that's ever won a championship. There's always those one or two games where you just got to survive. I mean, hell, I'm an Auburn fan. I remember during 2010, we won a national championship, had to kick a game-winning field goal against Kentucky. Like, there's some that you just got to survive. The Nick Saban says this all the time. You can get your team up to play at their highest level five, maybe six times a year. And that's, that's the best of all time doing it. It's those – not that you don't – want to play good our guys don't want to play if you played how you wanted to play nobody would ever play bad but it's just going out there and getting 11 guys to execute at the same time and play at the highest level of efficiency from a mental physical and fundamental standpoint that's hard to do with, with five guys in basketball let alone 11 guys on a football field so some games you just got to survive and you're four to state you're a big deal when you play other teams there you're one of the games that they get up for the most to play so that's the one you know you want to have the target on your back you want to be the king that wears the crown and walks around you know uh, the village and waves at people and gets back in your chariot but that comes with a price there's a bounty on your head every weekend you go out there you're going to get people's best shot so uh the transit of property in college football is a dangerous proposition to use i watched holy cross run through boston college like a finish line the week before and it was a totally different boston college team the next week Whenever you're dealing with 18 to 22-year-old kids, hell, it's hard enough in the NFL to get grown men making millions of dollars to be able to show up and play their best every Sunday, let alone an 18 to 22-year-old kid unless you know, you're like BYU and you got a bunch of 30-year-olds out there, but that's still <laughs> tough. But no, I mean, at the end of the day, um, Mike Norvell and them do a really good job of, of treating it like a faceless opponent because that's the trick. It's not about who you're playing. It's about yourself. And once you learn that, uh, it, it's amazing how freeing that can be.